Hi everybody, this is Mr. Farmer and welcome to AP Microeconomics. Today we're talking market equilibrium and also interference. What does that do to the marketplace? Here we go. So first off, what is equilibrium? Equilibrium is where the demand curve crosses the supply curve. It's where the supply and demand in the market is balanced. It's equalized, all those kinds of good things. So the two main things are the equilibrium price that's the price of which the market is at its status quo, uh, and the equilibrium quantity, which is where the market is where it wants to be between the buyer and the seller. Note, the market equilibrium is not always met. It's not always balanced. Sometimes it's just where the market quantity is, and we're going to talk a lot more about that concept later on when we start talking about different market structures and those kinds of things. So what does it look like? This, it looks like the supply and demand curve. It's the equilibrium price we talked about before, equilibrium quantity, the market price, market quantity. It's just that's where it settles down to be. And if there's nothing else going on, that's where the market's going to want to stay. Like you learned about the other day, the determinants of supply and demand can shift that, in which case, well, now the market is at a new equilibrium because their circumstances are different because consumers got more income, the resource prices to produce goods got more expensive, and therefore things shift and move. And so the equilibrium price can definitely change. Again, we usually look at the graph, but I do want to remind us about the schedules. So on the left, we have the total quantity supplied per week at the second column, the prices, so at $5.00 the producers are willing to produce 12,000 units, and then you can see it decreases as the price goes down. The third column, the total demand per week, is at $5. The consumers will demand 2,000. And then we have a surplus and a shortage, just 12 minus 2,000 equals 10,000, etc., etc., etc. So what do we know? When the price is higher than the equilibrium price, like $4 and $5, we have a surplus, meaning more stuff is available in the market than it's actually going to be bought, hence we have a positive numbers. On the other side, a shortage is going to be like the prices of 2 and 1, where there's just not enough stuff on the shelf. It is short. And so we see that in that far right-hand column. Now, usually this isn't on the schedule. You just do this mathematically, but the math isn't exactly super tough. Now, of course, where we want to be is at the market equilibrium, where at a price of $3, both the producers and the consumers agree that $7,000 sounds really nice. Now, again, the producer doesn't want to overproduce, because if they produce 10,000 units, only 4,000 get bought, they still have to produce the other 6,000 units. That's a loss to them, because they don't get that money back. So, again, they really do want to try and be at the right price. So where is the surplus graphically? Uh, it's above the price. So the excess supply is going to be, so you go straight across that black curve, uh, and that's going to cross the supply curve over to the right, and the demand curve over to the left. And so the quantity supplied is going to be greater than the quantity demanded at that price. Where is the shortage? It's going to be at that lower section. Okay, and so at that lower section, the coin demanded, that low price of coin demand is going to be higher and greater than the coin supplied. And when that happens, we call that a shortage. Now, for the time being, a shortage and a surplus are going to occur because of a price ceiling and a price floor. Now, these are going to be government imposed prices, they're going to be regulated prices that the market has to abide by. So, let's talk about that. So the minimum legal selling price of a good, you cannot sell below this. Well, that's kind of what a floor does. Unless you have a jackhammer, you can't go below a floor, and so that's what it illustrates. At a minimum price of $8, you cannot legally sell below that. Even though you want to go down to the $5 price, you can't go below that price. So what happens? Well, there's a surplus. Why? Because the quantity supplied is 8 units at that $8 price, whereas the quantity demanded is 2 at that $8 price. So we have a surplus of 6 units at that price of 8. 
It's a minimum legal price, so you can you can sell at ten, twelve, what fourteen dollars if you want. You each can't sell below that price. So a price floor creates a surplus, typically speaking. One thing to note: a favorite question college board is, what if they set a minimum f price at say two dollars? What is it? Price floor, price ceiling. Well, $2, that's below the equilibrium price. Yes, but I said it's still the minimum legal price. It's still a price floor. It's just an ineffective price floor. It still meets the requirements. It's a minimum threshold, but it is a price floor. Because of that, it just doesn't do anything, so we call it ineffective. With that said, if we say price floor, we will assume it is an effective price, meaning it would be like that $8 price. How about a maximum legal price? Well, that's going to be something like $2. You cannot sell above that $2, so that's a ceiling. Again, you can't go above a ceiling. You, you hit your head on it, and that's exactly what it does. It creates a ceiling you can't go above. So we have a shortage. At a price of $2, the consumers want to buy 8 units, but the producers only want to sell 2 units, so we have a shortage of six. We're, we're six units short of what we need to be. And again, College Board does like to ask the question, what if there's a maximum threshold of $20 billion? That's super not helpful, government, but it's still a maximum price, so it will be a price ceiling regardless. So the rationing function of prices sounds really complex, and it's really not. It it's the idea that due to the competition, the consumers and producers will establish a price in which both the buyers and sellers are comfortable. So what's that mean? So essentially, in competitive pricing, meaning there's a large number of buyers and a large number of suppliers, that's the competition aspect, both groups are going to try and be as efficient as possible. On the producer side, they're going to look at productive efficiency, and that's going to be a larger topic later on. So we're going to kind of put that to the side. But a big thing that comes through when there's competitive pricing is this idea of allocative efficiency. It means that the goods produced will be the most highly valued. So what's the rationing function of prices? It's the idea that the price acts rationally. So if there is a change to the demand, like the consumers have a larger income, use that example before, then they're willing to spend more money. So rationally, the prices will increase. If the producers get a new technology that speeds up productivity and they can decrease their costs, rationally, the prices will probably decrease. Now again, do we actually see that in marketplaces? We're going to get more into that. We're at the very beginning of this conversation. So the big takeaway, the suppliers and consumers will agree on a market price and the quantity based on the circumstances of the industry. And if those circumstances changes, the prices will follow that ration and change also. With that in mind, let's go over some practice. So demand increases because of income, number of supply, number of consumers, substitute goods, complementary goods, expectations, taste, preference, all those things. Well, then the demand shifts to the right. The demand increases. So the price of the goods would increase and the quantity demanded would increase. The market equilibrium would increase as well. What if the supply increases? Okay, it's going to shift the supply curve to the right, increases right, decreases the shift to the left. So based on that, we're looking at the orange. So the price of the market has decreased, the quantity has increased compared to the original equilibrium of six. Okay, and so typically in, in at our level, either supply or demand will shift. But just for kicks and giggles, what would happen if supply and demand both increased, what would happen? Well, we have it on here, and so the quantity, we're going to be looking at like the, the, the green and orange intersecting, the quantity is going to increase, and the price looks like it's about going to not change. So is that true? Well, let's try this again. So, demand increases, supply increases. What happened? The 
price increase to eight dollars just made up some numbers and the quantity increased to eight units okay let's try it again okay so demand increased but only a little bit not as much as it did last time and the supply increased but a lot more than it did last time so what happened the price decreased quantity still roughly increased about eight a little bit change so the question is which is true did the price increase did the price decrease or did we have it right originally when we said it didn't change what we're talking about is a thing called indeterminance meaning we don't actually know when both curves shift unless we're given very specific information we don't know which one is correct no matter what the quantity will have increased I know that because I checked. I also know that because we're in the right quadrant, and so it's always going to shift to the right. The vertical is going to be a little bit challenged. Are we going up or down the price? No matter what, the quantity would always increase over here. This is because we do not know the magnitude of the shift. Was it a small or a large shift in demand and supply? We don't really know. So for the example on the right, the increase in demand supply the price is indeterminate. We don't know where it's going to land. The quantity is determinable. It's going to increase. What if you did a decrease in supply and increase in demand? Then you're going to be in that top quadrant, and so your price will have always increase and your quantity be indeterminate. Well, if you're in that left quadrant, then the quantity will always decrease, the price will be indeterminate. You can memorize where it is, you'll practice that, and you can kind of see where it goes. Or if you're really not sure, just do what I did. Draw a small change and then a large change and reverse those and see which one is consistent. Last topic, burden of tax. So one of the determinants of supply is government intervention and there's kind of a subcategory of uh, taxes and subsidies. So if there's a tax on producers, the burden of tax asks who actually pays it? Where does the money come from? So I have S and then S plus tax. And so all those units would be an increase in the tax. And yes, you just do a proportional um, to that. Again, not drawn to scale is going to be a very important term because we're just freehanding this. So you should draw the two curves parallel, even though probably not very accurate. So the government imposes a tax on the market. The value of the per unit tax is equal to the distance between S and the S plus tax. So what we're going to do use the new market quantity output to determine the value. In this case, Q2 um, is going to be the new quantity. And then the tax is going to be P1 to P2. You can see I put a per unit tax on there. So the question is, of that per unit tax, how much comes from the consumers? How much comes from the producers? Well, the burn of tax discusses who generates the money. So even though the tax is on the producers, some portion of that payment is going to come from the consumers. How do I know this? Well, the original price for the consumers was at price P. Because the tax, the price increased to P1. So because the tax, the consumers are paying P1 minus P times the quantity they now purchase, and so that's going to be that red consumer tax burden. So they're paying that portion of the tax. How about the producers? Well, originally they got to charge a price of P. Now they functionally only get P2. Why? Because the P1 to P2, that whole area, that's going to the government. That's their tax revenue. That doesn't go to the producers. So the producers only get a P2 out of this income. So how much do they have to spend? P to minus P2 is going to be the producer burn of tax times the quantity. Now when we get into the topic called elasticity, we're going to talk even more about how the burn of tax can shift more towards the consumers or the producers. So this topic does come back. So let's do a little breakdown. Consumers used to pay $8. Great. Due to the tax curve, this price increased to $10, which means the consumers pay two extra dollars out of this burden of tax. I can see the whole burden of tax is $5. That's the 10 minus the 5 on there. The producers only collect 
So what does this mean? They need to find $3 from somewhere. Where it come from? The producers had to produce that $3. So again, the provider, the buyer is only providing $2. The total tax is $5 and the producer is producing $3. So the burden of tax is $2 to the consumers and $3 to the producers times again the quantity of Q2. So we are in AP economics, and so let's talk about the FRQs. They are different than other FRQs if you've taken other social studies courses or other AP courses in general. Um, in fact, there is very little writing. Um, it, it's more of like a math type course in that you're, you're writing pretty much like math proofs. Um, downside is we use a lot of math and a lot of graphs to really prove our points. So the typical rundown is you start with a scenario. You'll be asked to draw a graph. You'll start with a graph, something along those lines, and then something happens. So identify the shift on the graph, what it looks like. Identify the new price point, the new quantity, something that would happen. Explain why you think that would happen. And then, because of whatever happened, there might be a little bit of a domino effect. What would happen next? More producers would come up. They would produce at a profit. Uh, they're going to increase tax, whatever it might be. If it's a longer for a queue, there's going to be more links to it. But again, it all starts with supply and demand. How are people producing the good? How is somebody wanting the good? And what price and quantity are they all going to agree at and be at? And then what changes that circumstance? If you have any questions, definitely let me know on the supply and demand. It is the basis for economics, and so we really want a good handle before we move on. Until next time.